Hello again, and welcome back to light. I've broken up the last section of this chapter into two lectures. Today we'll learn about the three basic types of spectra, and we'll understand how we use spectra to determine what elements distant celestial objects are composed of. In the second lecture, we'll see how we use light to determine both temperature and how objects are moving through space. Why does a rose look red? In an earlier lecture, we learned that the petals of a red rose appear red because they absorb all the light that hits them except for red, which gets reflected. The stem of the rose appears green because the stem absorbs all the colors of the light except for green, which gets reflected. This actually tells us something about the rose. The petals must contain different green absorbing molecules than the stem, which must contain red absorbing molecules. We can get even more information about the rose or anything else by dispersing its light into a spectrum. A spectrum is the band of colors produced by separating the components of light according to wavelength. A rainbow is a familiar spectrum. Raindrops act as tiny prisms, and we disperse the white light of the sun into its component wavelengths, or colors. If we wanted to analyze the sun's light from its spectrum, we could put the light through a prism and study the resulting rainbow, but it makes more sense to display the spectrum as a graph. A graph of a spectrum plots the intensity of light at each wavelength. The process of obtaining a spectrum and reading the information it contains is called spectroscopy. This is a visual spectrum, or what we see when we put a light source through a prism. And below is the corresponding plot of intensity versus wavelength. This object is emitting the most light at 500 nanometers, or in the green part of the spectrum, and less light at shorter, and longer wavelengths. We learned in an earlier lecture that longer wavelength light has a lower energy than shorter wavelength light, which has a higher energy. Here is an example spectrum. Think about the green leaves on that rose. This is what the spectrum would look like. The intensity peaks in the green from the green reflected light. And here is the spectrum of a toaster oven. We have the intensity peaking in the red and stretching into the infrared, or heat, but very little anywhere else. There are three basic types of spectra. We'll talk about each one individually in a moment. The first is a continuous spectrum. It looks like a continuous rainbow. The second is an absorption line spectrum. It looks like a rainbow with dark lines on it. The third is an emission line spectrum. It has bright lines instead of dark, dark lines. Spectra of astronomical objects are usually combinations of these three basic types. The spectrum of a traditional light bulb, the kind with a wire filament, gives an unbroken rainbow of color when you pass its light through a prism. We call this type of spectrum a continuous spectrum. Now let's put a cloud of gas in between the light and the prism. For the sake of simplicity, let's assume the cloud is composed only of hydrogen. As before, the light bulb gives the atoms in the cloud photons of all different energies. You may recall from the last lecture what happens when you give an atom energy in the form of light. If an atom is given just the right amount of energy, an electron can jump from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. Since the light bulb is emitting photons with all wavelengths of light, or equivalently all energies, some of those photons are going to be just right to get the electron in our atom to jump from one level to another. Here, the photon hits the atom, the electron jumps, and the photon is absorbed. The absorbed photons, therefore, don't make it into the prism. They are missing from the spectrum. Where those photons should be in the spectrum, there are dark lines. 
When we look at the absorption line spectrum as a graph of intensity versus wavelength, the dark absorption lines appear as dips on a continuous background. The background is from the light source. The dips are where there is less light, exactly at the wavelengths where the electrons absorbed the photons from the light. Okay, I know what you're thinking. You're remembering the last lecture when I said that an electron in a higher energy level will jump back down to a lower level and the atom will emit a photon. And you're wondering, if the atom emits a photon of the same energy as it absorbed, then why is the photon missing from the spectrum? A couple of reasons. First, the photons that are emitted get emitted in random directions, so most do not make it into the prism at all. Second, the electron may drop back down to its original level in multiple steps and therefore emits photons with different energies than the originally absorbed photon. For example, the electron can go from level 3 to level 1 or from level 3 to 2 emitting a lower energy photon than from level 2 to 1. Now let's consider an emission line spectrum. Imagine the same situation as for the absorption line spectrum, only we move the light bulb to below the cloud of gas. The light bulb is still giving the cloud photons of all different energies, but from this angle, the prism can't see the light bulb. This means we won't see a continuous rainbow in the background like we did before. In this case, the only photons we have a chance of seeing are those that happen to make it into the prism. The photons emitted by the atom as the electron drops from a higher energy level to a lower one are still coming out of the cloud in random directions, and some of them will make it into the prism, but we won't see all of them. We'll see more of them now because we don't have the bright light bulb behind the cloud. When we look at the emission line spectrum as a graph of intensity versus wavelength, the emission lines appear as spikes. They are essentially the only light making it into the prism. The absorption lines for a particular element appear at the same wavelengths as the emission lines for that element. The amazing thing about all of this is that spectra can tell us what elements a distant object is made of. Remember, every element has a unique set of energy levels. This means that the wavelengths of light absorbed and emitted by the cloud will depend on the cloud's composition. Each type of atom has a unique spectral fingerprint. We can figure out what elements a distant object is composed on based on the object's spectrum. It really is amazing. Stars always produce absorption line spectra. The core of the star is like the light bulb. Nuclear reactions in the core produce photons of all energies. The star's atmosphere is a gas cloud composed mostly of hydrogen, some helium, and a lesser amount of heavier elements. The core of the star is underneath the stellar atmosphere, just like the light bulb is behind the gas cloud in our absorption line spectrum example. By looking at the spectrum of a star, we can determine exactly what elements its atmosphere is made of. To do spectroscopy, we need to be able to compare our celestial spectra with the spectra of elements taken on Earth. In the lab, we can find out the wavelengths of emission and absorption lines for different elements. This is done by taking tubes of gases, this is helium for example, and getting the atoms to emit light by plugging in the tube so that a current passes through it. The atoms jostle around and the electrons jump up, jump down, and then emit their, their photons. We pass the light through a spectrometer, and then we can obtain a spectrum for each element. At the telescope, we can take a spectrum of the object we're interested in, say a star. We compare the star spectrum with the spectra of gas tubes we took in the lab. We match up the lines, and then we can determine what elements are in the star. This is the spectrum of our sun. 
Is it an absorption line spectrum or an emission line spectrum? Absorption, of course. Molecules also produce spectral fingerprints. Because they are made of two or more atoms bound together, molecules can rotate and vibrate. Rotation and vibration require energy, and the possible energies of rotation and vibration are quantized, similar to electron energy levels. The energy level spacing in molecules are usually smaller than in atoms, and therefore molecules produce lower energy photons, often in the infrared. The energy levels also tend to be bunched up more closely together than in atoms, so molecules produce spectra with many sets of tightly bunched lines called molecular bands. This was a really full lecture, I know. Take your time absorbing, haha, -ha, the material, and let me know if you have questions. I will talk to you soon.